<clears throat> yeah, okay. So, good morning, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream of this meeting. Welcome to this meeting of the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee. My name is Councillor Tony Mason, and I am the chair of the committee. Please can those present in the council chamber note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. The camera follows the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are advised to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. Please can those participating in the meeting via the live stream indicate that you wish to speak via the chat column. Please do not use a chat column for any other purpose. Make sure that your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you are invited to do otherwise. Please ensure that you have switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt the proceedings. Please use a headset when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. When you are invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately, speak slowly and clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Introduction. Apologies. Item one on our agenda today is apologies for absence. Patrick, are there any apologies for absence today, please? Yes, Chair. We've had apologies from Councillor Joe Sales. Councillor Williams. Apologies from Mark Howe, Chair. Okay. Um, declarations of interest. Do any members have interests to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? If an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, please would you raise this at that point? Any declarations of interest? None declared? Okay, I, agenda item three. Minutes. Are members happy to approve the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on 29th of July 21 as a correct record? Any comments? The only comment I had was in relation to, um, on page two, we were wished uh, Suresh Patel well for the future, which just goes, we wished him for the future. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then whether we can, whether Peter can confirm that for the, um, there are a number of items from the minutes on information to be presented at this meeting, if, if that, that they will be presented. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I can confirm that the number of full-time equivalents that we have now is 17 and a half. Um, back in the on the 31st of December, it was 15, and the previous year it was 14. So I can confirm that since uh, September 2019, we did employ a full-time equivalent to deal with the account, plan the account process over and above the existing person that we had. And then after December, we've appointed a chief accountant who will also be involved in the 1920 accounts closure and, and audit process. We've also taken, we also have another one and a half FTEs that will be also be involved in the process. So, um, as regards to the structure of the finance team, obviously um, I lead the finance function. There is a chief accountant below me who leads the accounting and budgeting process. We then have three um, principal accountants who do deal with either um, the general fund, one deals with the general fund, one deals with the housing revenue account, and the third one deals with things like the collection fund, and final accounts and things like that. Uh, so there are then six people under our general fund accountant, five under our final accounts accountant. We also have a procurement manager and three people in, under them as well, and they will also have some involvement in the final accounts delivery. So um, that's basically what the structure is. We also, <coughs> we also then have the two dedicated resources that lead um, the audit of the accounts. So they're called James Carter and Tracy Freeman. Um, and their support will be provided to them from other accountants as and when information is required. Um, 
before we reach the 1920 audit, we will be assessing whether we need a further resource to service that audit. Um, but at, at this stage, those discussions are yet to be had. Um, initial discussion suggests we may need a further half a person, possibly, um, but we'll engage them at the time we need them, which will um, presumably be January 2022, when the 1920, 19, the 2019-20 audit is due to commence. So that we'll, if we need an additional resource to service that audit, we'll make sure we have them in place in time for that process to, to be completed. I think that's probably all on that point. Um, Thank you for, for those figures. Um, if possible, sort of after the meeting, if um, particularly with the structure, if we can maybe have an organisational chart or something circulated, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Could I ask how those, do we know how those figures compare to other, other councils of similar sizes? Um, we've got slightly more in our finance team here than my previous authority, um, but there are one or two functions carried out in finance that we didn't carry out in finance in my previous authority. So it's a little bit difficult to compare like with like. I, 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 to me, they seem about right for the size of council that we've got based on my experience. But obviously, with the fact that um, we're behind in the accounts, we're going to need some short-term additional resources to make sure we see that through so that the two resources that we've got would obviously only be in place until such time as we catch up potentially. We'll, we'll get on to uh, comments later. We, we, um, I've had meetings last week with EY uh, alongside Peter, so the, the, the new uh, audit head. Um, they, we will have their agenda item at the end AOB. So we will go through the, the agenda items in order and then come back to EY. EY will then come in uh, at, that, at that agenda item and we will have an update on progress for the current year audit and input from the committee um, against that progress. Okay. Can members confirm that they're happy to accept the minutes then on that basis? Approved? Yeah. Okay, the committee therefore agrees the approval of the minutes as a correct record. Um, we now go to agenda item four, audit and governance update. My, uh, is John, Jonathan online? I can see him. Hello, yes, Joe, I, I'm online, yes. Okay, if, if you can uh, introduce this item. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so at the last uh, committee uh, meeting, you recall that it was suggested it could be good practice to um, provide an update across the various different areas of governance that the committee considers. Um, so what we thought could be helpful is that if we provided a sort of like brief overview of progress and where we are on various items uh, and also topical updates. So we sort of provided this sort of document um, for circulation um and uh hopefully it's fairly self-explanatory and easy to follow i'm happy to take uh questions uh on the contents but also take some feedback on uh, whether that's the sort of thing that you find useful councillor williams thank you um just one thing on page five <clears throat> you might want to sort the error out because error bookmark not defined um, on that page so, um, and the other thing was and I appreciate this is sort of difficult to assess but on the cases of fraud we've got the type which is which is very helpful um, but I was wondering if there's any indication as to whether it was um, on purpose or unintentional because obviously if it's something that people aren't understanding that they need to do, then that's something that we can maybe assist to reduce those figures. Whereas if it is people 
doing things on purpose, obviously there's no, nothing we can put in place to stop stop people wanting to do that. Um, so just wondering whether in the way that we're looking at, at these cases, if there's a possibility to make such a distinction. Thank you, Chair. So, um, with regards to uh, corporate fraud, that falls under me. Um, so, um, obviously, when we do a fraud investigation, it gets referred to the team, and as part of the process of um, doing the investigation, they will assess whether the fraud appears to be deliberate fraud, or whether, in fact, it was an error or a mistake. So, obviously, that's taken into account as part of, part of that process. Um, I will say that, um, obviously, up until June 20. 21, things were very difficult for fraud investigation. We weren't really allowed to progress investigations. We weren't allowed to have any face-to-face uh, -face meetings. So the team did actually spend a lot of time between um, April 2020 and, and June 2021 on fraud prevention. So I think there's a lot of work we can do on fraud prevention, making people aware of, 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 the, of the work that we're doing. And hopefully as part of that process, members of the public will be aware how important it is um, that they make sure they tell us of circumstance changes in relation to council tax and things like that. So hopefully, the more we do on fraud, fraud, fraud prevention, um, the less likely people are going to end up being investigated for fraud because of a mistake. So that they are, that's, that's certainly some of the thinking that we're doing at the moment. Thank you. Councillor Hardy. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, on the the same table on page eight, the fraud uh, prevention. Um, I suppose we would be quite interesting to have some sort of um, metric that kind of gives an order of magnitude of, you know, are, are these um, you know, attempted frauds that have been detected? Um, you know, what what would be the value of um, you know, say if they hadn't been detected, um, because I, I can't, I think, think we can see from here whether we're talking about sort of, you know, hundreds of pounds or, or millions, but uh, it'd be quite interesting to know. I, I know it would be difficult because it's ongoing, but uh, is, is there anything we could do to indicate an order of magnitude there? Interesting, myself and the, the fraud manager have been talking about how we measure some of these, um, some of these things, because obviously, you know, some of the um, council tax discount type frauds can be quite small. Some of the larger frauds, particularly in relation to right to buy, you know, we're talking about quite large sums of money. So we're, we're looking at ways that we can assess the sort of savings that the council's made by detecting that fraud. The team is sort of still in its infancy because of, um, the team was set up back in April 2020 and pretty much straight away we had the pandemic. So there was, it was quite difficult in getting things off the ground. So we've only really had the fraud team in place, I would suggest, in its current form since December 2020. So we took on two new people. They've both been trained up in the last three to four months to become fraud investigators. So I think it's going to be the next six to nine months we start to see a lot more coming through, I think, particularly now that we can interview um, cases and progress them properly. Yeah, I mean, certainly we're looking at how we measure the savings that, that have occurred by detecting the fraud. Um, there are sort of nationally recognised ways of, of coming up with figures, but equally, I, I think we would probably want to try and um, make that more on a local basis, so we need to have a little bit of a think about how we're going to do that. But, uh, yeah, I think that's something we should, we should do. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you, Shree, you Chair. Well, that's interesting and i suppose also there's an interesting moral question there isn't there because um you could say well uh, fraud um should be tracked down and stopped wherever it happens I, I suppose the other way of looking at it is you know um would we save more money than um, the people we employ to track it down i, I wonder is there a sort of balance to be struck there mm. and it, it no it is an interesting point because the, t the team is um, sort of split 50 50 between prevention and detection so you know a lot of the prevention work, it would be very difficult to, to say, well, how much money can we save from prevention? Because obviously, 
prevention is better than cure. I think most people would accept that, and we are putting more resources into that. I'm fairly confident that the, the team overall will pay for itself though with the work that he does. Okay, I mean, the, the only comment I had was uh, there, there were 24 in the past quarter, but we haven't got a comparable before previous quarters just to, just to understand whether that there was an ongoing trend in certain areas. It might be useful to follow up on so we can have a quarter by quarter review across the, the main areas to see if, if uh, especially in in current climate, if there are issues around tax being collected and, and council tax, um, that sort of thing. I think on, on similar lines, I think it'd be um, helpful to see in due course um, the uh, some measure for the processing time for the investigations, um, so that it can be compared on a like-for-like uh, -like basis over a period of time. Um, clearly, I, I assume that. The processing time will vary depending on the complexity um, and uh, seriousness of, of the cases. But I think o over time, some sort of metric that shows how, how well well we're doing in terms of processing would be helpful. Yeah, thanks. I'll have to have a think about how we would do that. But yeah, it's certainly something we could look at. No further comments? Committee happy to accept this this report. Thanks to Jonathan Tully for this report and, and the committee has, has noted the, the report being presented. So we move on to agenda item five, the Treasury Management. Uh, may I ask Peter Maddock to present this item? Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, as part of the Prudential Code, um, the uh, number of um, reports that need to be issued so there's an annual treasury report that we produce there's also a, a um, mid-year report that has to be produced and also a treasury strategy so this report looks at the year that's that ended March uh, 31st of March 2021 and it looks at activity for that financial year um, you'll see for at, uh, paragraph 5 there's details uh, of um, the loans that we have with the PWLB, and we also have loans out uh, with uh, other local authorities. Um, we then have paragraph six, have a table of our investments, so where our, our short-term cash has been invested. Um, you'll see there's a, there are, paragraph 16, we have uh, a number of loans uh, out, five million with places for people um, with varying degrees of maturity. Uh, there's another table on our, a more um, summary table on, on what our borrowings were and you'll see that to, to the end of March for uh, 2021 it was uh, just short of 250 million. Um, there's a table at 25 for example which shows the outturn and some of the key areas such as the interest publicly paid in the year um, and the interest that Received. And there's a table there showing how our position outturn compared to the budget. Although it was fairly close, there were several fairly large swings within categories, but overall it was fairly close to what we predicted. Um, further on, there's uh, information about our um, <coughs> investment returns. Um, and you'll see that, for example, our investment returns have been generally better than the client average. Um, and also, um, we've got the weighted average credit risk. And again, um, the credit risk has varied from time to time, sometimes below, sometimes above. I don't know whether there's any questions on anything in particular there or, or the report generally. It's a fairly technical paper, but um, it's just basically a, a, a roundup of what happened. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry if this is a question coming from um, a position of ignorance, but um, I just wonder what the units are on the weighted average credit risk, and what do those numbers actually mean?
probably I'll probably need to get a bit more detail from my colleague, but um, it's um, we do we're in a benchmarking club with a number of other authorities, and and there's a, a formula that you use to arrive at a sort of like a weighted average. Now I'm not sure of the detail of how we get to that, but um, I can certainly find out a bit more on that because um, it's a little, you know obviously at 31st of March 2020 our weighted um, credit risk was a, was a bit lower whereas it seems to be a bit higher later on. So I, I, I probably need to understand a bit more detail behind that. But I, I can provide some more detail on that for my colleague. Councillor Williams. Thank you. Um, and through yourself, Chair, if we could find out, just looking on page 14, it referenced the ice rink. I appreciate much of um, what goes on with that is commercially sensitive, but if there's any possible update as to the sort of status of, of things there. Um, and the other question, Chair, is on page 16 in relation to the short-term borrowing on the first line, the, the new debt of 44 million. <coughs> Sorry, Chair. Um, so the short-term, from my understanding, is sort of 12 months, but quite often it's therefore refinanced. So although it's labelled as a short-term borrowing, it's actually intentional we're going to be in the long term so just wondering what the plans were for the 44 million um whether it be refinanced and and if so for how long is it foreseen thank you chair thank you so as regards uh, the ice rink and um, we lent money for the ice rink uh, a couple of years ago maybe three now for, for a while now we've been in discussion with them um, they obviously uh, have struggled negotiations have been ongoing about how we can support them. Uh, there isn't anything more I can really say at this stage due to the, the nature of those those discussions, but I think we're getting towards a point where we might be able to agree perhaps an extension to the loan or something, but that's something that we need to we need to bottom out and I'm hopeful in the next couple of months we'll have something to report. Um, I can confirm that the ice rink has been quite busy. So Clearly, um, people have gone back to skating, including, including one of my colleagues who couldn't even get in the car park because it was so busy. So there are good signs um, for the ice rink in the number of people that are going, but you know, there's, there's still an issue there that we need to bottom out, and hopefully in the next couple of months we'll have an answer. Um, and the second question. So um, as at the end of March, we had 44 million borrowings um, and now these were short-term borrowings uh, and the reason for that is that the rate on short-term borrowings is extremely competitive compared to long-term borrowings we've been talking to our um, treasury advisors over a period of time their view still is that the strategy should be to borrow short term but because the money that was borrowed is in support of longer term assets such as ermine street or um, some of the the properties we purchased on the science park we will at some stage move to longer term borrowing and it's just a case of assessing at what time that would be the right what time would be the right time and what time would make financial sense for the council really what's the risk assessment on that If, 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 if there was a, a, a liquidity crisis, given that there's a Chinese investor company that's even with billion in debt and goes, hits, hits the wall, what happens if, 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 if there's a repeat of 2008 and there's a liquidity crisis and you, they've got short-term loans against long-term assets? Well, as I say, we're, we're, talking to our, we're talking to our treasury advisors at the moment and they'll get another meeting with me coming up next month to assess whether we go long-term or not. I mean, I think, you know, based on the conversations we've had um, and based on their advice, we believe that's the best thing to do at this stage. I mean, it's always very difficult to predict what's going to happen in the future. You never, you know, we obviously never thought that COVID was going to come along and we never thought. So, it, you know, it is a, a difficult balancing act and we do talk on a regular basis to make sure that, um, you know, we believe we're doing the best thing for the council. Certainly at the moment, the interest rates on short-term borrowing 
is significant, but that's the long-term buying, and I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds in a year. So, you know, I cannot, I cannot see, based on the information I have, that long-term buying makes sense at the moment, but I totally agree, at some point we are going to have to go, and we just need to make sure it's the right time. Thank you, Chair. Um, more, of a, more of a comment than a question, just that um, I think I can understand why there was sort of some concern expressed, Chair, on your, on your face at, at, at this. Um, I also agree that the way that the interest rates are at the moment between short and long term borrowing is something that I don't think any of us would say make any sense at present because it's been long history that long term borrowing rates would be lower, such as mortgages etc um, rather than the short term um, however for some reason it seems the other way around at the moment what may help um, is is so you could from reading this look short-term borrowing that debt is going to be paid off in in 12 months you could you could unintentionally make that assumption um, it may be um, it may be helpful for us to be able to see when the sort of terms of that loan expires, for what period it is, and if it, the plan is to be refinancing and how much, you know, how much will be refinancing. Because it, it, I could be misinterpreting your, your question, Chair, but I think we're along the same lines as that the concern is if we get to the end of the loan period and we can't refinance it, then we have to pay it. Um, so, which might be okay in one instance we might want to keep more than on another so we perhaps need more information to assess assess this risk as an audit committee if you're agreeable chair yeah i think it's, it's again it's looking at we are getting professional advice and getting professional advisors there were professional advisors in 2008 who said it's all going to be fine and the world didn't so reality can come in, come back and bite us. Um, and I'm sure people who've been advised to go and put their money into Icelandic bank school was fine, and they went wrong. So we have to take professional advice from the professionals, but also assess it in light of potential risks. Yes, it's cheap in the short term to get short term borrowing compared to longer term, but actually, are we taking on additional risk ourselves that is in, in excess of what really we, we should be doing. I think you're right, we need to have a, a view of the cost of that long-term versus short-term borrowing and, 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 and an assessment from, from our advisors as to why they, see, why they say it's still appropriate to keep it short-term on short-term borrowing on long-term assets. We, we've got an input here, but not actual it, it, input from the, prof the professional advisors. I think I, I, I'd be grateful to see some feedback from the professional advisors to outline why they s still feel it is appropriate to have short-term borrowing on, on long-term assets, given the potential, as we come out of COVID, for markets to change quite rapidly. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I, I think that's a good point. I mean, as I'm talking to the advisors next month, and I can give some information in relation to that yet again. Councillor Harvey. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just wondered um, if you could sort of just talk through um, in uh, Section 6 under investments. Um, so the South Cams Limited balance is 71 million I think um, so is is that sort of including um, within that investment cash that's awaiting investment um, and then is is the interest accrued which is roughly 0.7% is, is that is that sort of net um, if you like um, effectively income generated within South, South Cams minus the, the cost of um, what we charge. I, I just, like, I wonder if you could explain how those numbers uh, derive. 
Yeah, so the the eighty so we have eighty four million with um, South Canton as the end of March, and the, the loans are made as and when a purchase is uh, is agreed. So um, you'll get notification that a purchase is due. Um, we usually get three to four weeks notice, so I should we can manage our short term cash in such a way so that the money is available. The accrued interest would have been interest that they owed the council as of the end of thirty first of March. Um, it looks to me to be a couple of months, month and a half. I'm not exactly sure how much in the, uh, the period that interest relates to, um, but that would have then been paid to us uh, early in 2021-22. Okay, thank you. Councillor Williams. Thank you. It was just back onto the borrowing figures on on page 16. Um, I think. What you've asked for in seeing the advice I think would be um would be a good thing for the audit committee to look at and the governance and the risk assessing um, but i think also um to have some idea of how long we foresee to be holding this debt for and when do we think we will be paying it and you know what what are the sort of how are we going to phase our way out are we refinancing the full 44 are we are we coming down and things like that how are we what are we planning to do, um, and if so, how long? Because I think it's something that, with, with the comments you made, Chair, that if it's something that we thought we're going to refinance it for a couple of years, probably less concerned than if it was, say, over 20 or 50 years, because um, you know, the, the risk over, of change in the markets over a longer period is, is more, um, more uh, of an issue. So, uh, as regards to 44 million, um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but it's, I think it's about five tranches or six tranches of various loans with various uh, maturity dates. In fact, I think some are in maturity next month. So, we will be talking to our treasury advisors very shortly. In fact, it's probably something we'll raise in the next meeting as to whether we, because potentially the advice may be that perhaps we do start to go long. First five thousand, uh, five million. Um, so um, yeah, the, you know, and I think I have a feeling the next one is due probably in January, February. So we have it sort of staggered over a number of months between now and this time next year. I think. Um, Councillor Sample. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, when I read these reports, I often um, reflect on um, what is the message that we should be passing on to residents and to parish councils. So I wondered if you could sort of summarize uh, your view of uh, the health of our finances compared to last year and the risk in a, in a few sentences. Yeah, so you'll see that the majority of our borrowing is with the PWL, PWLB uh, in relation to our housing revenue accounts. Uh, at the time when that was taken out in 2012, there was a, a 30 year business plan that was uh, assessed that that was, um, you know, we, we could service that note over the long term. Um, the 30 year business plan is updated on a regular basis just to check that things are still uh, panning out as we expected, which is still the case. We do have another 30 year business plan produced fairly shortly to see how things are going. Um, it does demonstrate a difference in long term rates and short term rates quite clearly. Um, now, short-term borrowing um, has mainly been for our capital program, which is um, in relation to um, the investments we've purchased at MUD, Herman Street. Um, so, um, again, the loans that we've taken out are against longer-term assets, which, particularly on housing, you know, we, okay, we don't know where house prices are going to go, but it's a, it's certainly a view a fairly sound investment um, and um, you know you'd think that um, property prices will continue to, to go up over the long term um, so I don't think you know, we've taken out loans against uh, assets that shouldn't be that the loans were turned down there's no reason why we would consider that the loans were turned down by assets, um, I don't, you know, we can, we, you know, we can only 
take out um, borrowing for long-term, you know, long-term purchases. We we would, we would with it, whilst we would have a little bit of short-term cash, cash flow borrowing generally any borrowing that you'll take out will be for a longer-term asset, so that you know that you can pay off that that money within the time that you hold that asset. And uh, you know, if at some stage we decide we need to sell that asset, we hopefully get more money than than, than we've got in um, in borrowing. So I mean. My view would be for an authority this size, the level of borrowings are not overly overly significant. The HRA, you know, is a very big chunk, but there is a clear business case behind that. Uh, and um, g given that that was brought in to replace a, a, an old system where we were paying money directly to central government, um, you know, I think that that is fairly, you know, that is fairly secure. In, Long term, that we have a we have a plan in which to pay out off those loans as and when income comes in, and our HRA plan I think shows substantial surpluses in future years as um, as rents go up, and obviously the the interest rates are pretty much fixed. So our income is growing faster than our interest payments. So in terms of those particular loans, you know we've got a good plan behind how that's, how that's uh, dealt with. And again, on the general fund, I mean, I would particularly, particularly point to, to Ernestry as being, you know, we get substantial interest from that organisation that's far, far exceeds the interest that we're paying. So yeah, I mean, my view would be was, you know, in, in a healthy state from the borrowings that we have and not overburdensome in relation to the, the finances of the council. Maybe a question for Councillor Williams. I, I don't know, but uh, do, do we have a, a figure for the yield that we have on our assets? I mean, in, the t in relation to uh, interest income from Ermine Street, we get a little over three million a year. Um, in relation, I'm trying to think of it. In relation to our investment properties, what the figure is. I think the net budget we've got is just over four million at the moment in terms of um, income that we're achieving from those purchases after sort of management costs. I haven't got that information to go. I can certainly dig that out. If we've got an average rate of 3.51 as the, as the cost of, of, of those Loans against the assets. I was expecting us to get a yield of again up to seven, eight percent. Yeah, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head what the value of our HRA assets are, but I can. I mean, certainly um, our market value of our HRA assets is over a billion pounds, and I can't remember what the exact figure is. But then the balance sheet value is based on social housing values that are a different number. So I could, yeah, I'll have a look and see what yield is based on those two. Things. I think it would be useful if someone looking at the, the treasury loans that we're withdrawing out, that we have a yield value of the assets that we're loaning out of, that we can see overall what the potential net gain is of, of the yeah, loan. Yeah. Councillor Williams? Um, I was just going to say that perhaps that would, might be um, something that would be quite difficult to have that in the here and now perhaps, but maybe a piece of work can be done for our next meeting, Chair. Okay, thanks to Peter Maddock for the report. Um, the committee is asked to approve the Treasury Management Annual Report, but also the committee requests that there's some further guidance provided from our advisors for the short-term loans and also a view on the yield of the assets against the loan rate so that we can see the net gain at the next meeting. So we move on to item six, matters of topical interest. Um, this is an opportunity for the committee to discuss matters of topical interest and uh, we've added two reports 
that arise from the audit of the 2018-19 accounts. Can I please add our new head of external audit, Elizabeth Jackson? I don't think that's that's Elizabeth. Janet? Janet Dawson. Janet Dawson. Can I request uh, EY to present their, their report? Thanks, Chair. Um, and good morning, everybody. I'm Janet Dawson. Um, <laughs> Apologies for the confusion. Originally, Elizabeth Jackson was going to take over from Suresh. However, um, given the situation that the audit for 1819 is in and the significance of the delays that we've been experiencing to be able to close out the audit, I've stepped in. Um, I'm the partner who leads our government and public services practice for EY. Um, We've put a report together for you to set out the key areas that are still outstanding at the time of writing. And I, I am pleased to say that there has been an element of progress um, in the last fortnight, um, having prepared this report. Um, however, you know, I'm, I am so concerned about the difficulties that the organisation is experiencing to be able to provide the final pieces of information that we need, um, that I wanted just to set out to you you know, the next steps that I can consider taking um, to reflect on the the issues that, uh, as I say, the, the council is experiencing. Um, so you'll see in the second part of the report um, the, the key issues that were discussed, I believe, in July um, with Suresh. Um, but at, on the first page, what I've um, highlighted to you is our responsibilities under the uh, National Audit Office Code of um, uh, audit practice, um, which changed for 2020. Um, and what that requires me to do is consider now in this um, current reporting cycle for 2021, whether or not I think there are significant weaknesses in the arrangements within the organisation, and in particular to do with the ability to report um, the position financially. And if I do feel that there are um, significant weaknesses there, then I have to consider whether or not I need to um, invoke my special powers and report those to you and potentially to escalate those <clears throat> through preparing statutory recommendations. Now, what those would do would be to um, report to the council, to full council, and expect a response within 30 days as to what actions the organisation is going to take. And I put on that first page the key areas where I am concerned there is a significant weakness within the organisation, which is around the capacity and capability of officers within the finance function to adequately, adequately address issues, technical accounting queries in support of the audit in a timely manner, and the ability to prioritise resources to be able to deal with that to get the, the financial statements reported. And the third area is whether or not the governance arrangements are sufficiently robust to ensure that this um, these weaknesses are addressed. The reason that I've focus on this is because it's 12 months now since we started the audit and we raised these issues on the first week of the audit, that there was an issue around reconciliation of the uh, financial statements, the underlying general ledger and the new fixed asset register, and we still have not yet resolved that. Um, so I, you know, I do believe that there is a, a key issue here and our purpose as your auditors is not um, to help you do that um, and work through it with you over a year. It's actually to say, OK, we need to call this out now. And that's the, the, the purpose of the report. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, happy to take any questions. Mark also is on the call and has the, the detail behind a lot of this. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, if, through yourself, if I could ask some uh, some questions for our external auditors. So, first of all, it, it says that you're considering, and yet in your in your introduction of the report, it seemed a bit more final, like you were going to use your powers. So, it'd be very good to understand if that is going to happen or not, um, so that you know, things can be organised going forward. The other, other thing I wanted to ask was, we have had issues of um, resources from EY as well throughout this process. And 
I'm wondering if you can give us some clarification as to when you think the 2020 audit might be complete and if you could confirm if you have the resources in place. Um, I understand it's meant to be in the sort of summer of 2022, um, but can you confirm if we're, if we're going to meet that deadline in, in your eyes? And also, when would you think is a reasonable time in which we will be caught up and start reporting our counts on time? Thank you, Chair. So those are all um, good questions. Um, we had a discussion this morning about the progress that's being made. And I have a reluctance, Councillor Williams, to, um, to provide yet more leeway before I invoke my um, special powers, because what we've seen over the last um, period of months is uh, you know, information being promised and then that deadline being missed. However, we have made some progress in the last week, and I'm therefore um, prepared to give it another two weeks to see whether or not the information that we have been promised comes through by then. If it doesn't, then I will move to um, considering using my special powers. Now, I, I say it in that, that that's the terminology required uh, by the regulation. So until I invoke my special powers, I ha I'm only considering doing so. I'm going to give it another fortnight. And if we don't have what we've been promised at that point, then I will consider more formally and um, prepare a report and discuss with management. On the point on resources, I am very well aware that we had some difficulties in seven, completing the 1718 audit, both because of the issues at the council and because of resourcing pressures within EY. Now, I run the team of 250 specialist auditors um, that we employ nationally. And the issue at this stage is not our resourcing at all. The issue is that we are unable to plan effectively because we're not receiving the information that we require when we're promised it. So when, if we can move to a position where the council can provide us with um, the, the closed out accounts, a team that can support the audit process um, and that they understand what's in there and can move efficiently through supporting us, then we will provide the, the resources. Obviously, South Cams is sitting in a position where every time we miss, it has a knock on impact into all of our other resourcing that we have planned for other organisations. But we're committed to getting this done. And my, con my key concern is not my ability to match resources to you. It's your ability to provide the information to us when it's when it's been promised. Um, so the summer of next year, I'm not quite sure which set of accounts we'll be looking at at that point. I would like to be moving into the 21-22 accounts to your point to, about catching up. However, um, I'm concerned that the report in front of you states it'll, it'll take another couple of months to close out 1819 and then another month to prepare 1920 and then some more time to prepare 2021. And therefore, you know, we will have to come in once you are ready. So, so to clarify, you're, you're looking to get things caught up and in the summer being doing the 21 accounts. Is, is that what you've just said? Because that That's does what seem I'd like, like a lot of accounts to get through between now and then. It's a huge amount of work to get through, but it's a huge amount of work to get through from the council's perspective, which is where my concern about the capability and capacity of the finance function comes in. And it's a question of whether or not the organisation is committed to doing that or uh, not. So you, you said that there's two weeks on these 2019 accounts. So from what you're saying, your expectations are to be caught up by the summer. Um, does that mean that even if the response is in these two weeks that you may be considering to use your powers if we've not caught up the 22 accounts by the summer? Would that be a fair assessment of your comments? Didn't, I didn't quite follow your point, Councillor Williams, but it, but if it is that we don't make it within the next month to complete 1819, then then my concern is that the organisation will continue to move further to the right in terms of the timescale. It, it really depends on how much work is put in to close out the accounts for the years that are, are late, and then we will match resource to it. And if that happens, then we'll be able to be caught up by next by the end of next summer. 
these audits shouldn't take particularly long that's the thing however a year has passed if i can clarify chair my my question my question was because you've said about the 22 accounts for the summer whether even if in this two weeks you're given the information and within the month so put it, i mean 19 accounts are concerned is it a consequence that if we are not in place by the summer of 2022 with those accounts that you will be considering taking this action on the 2020 or 2021 accounts or will you be permitting more time if needed or are we facing with the same consequence if the accounts aren't caught up by the summer so so the point um, of reporting at this stage is because uh, and, and exercising special powers is because of my concern that action is not being taken. If we can move through that and I don't feel that I need to use my special powers, then I will still be reporting um, that there are weaknesses in the process. However, they may not be significant weaknesses. At this point, it'll be a question of how, what response is the council taking to catching itself up and if we can see a focus, um, an investment in resources, you know, a real application to get through this backlog by the council, then you know we'll be we'll be delighted, and we'll be working closely with you to do that. Um, and therefore, I would not need to exercise my special powers. However, I will be reporting regularly on on the progress being made. Thanks, Chair. Um, from you mentioned from your meetings with um, with South Cam's officers um, uh, on the on the eighteen nineteen accounts. Um, how how confident are you, or do you have a view of how confident you are regarding our the, the council's ability to complete this work within the two week period? Well, you have to remember that I'm new into this, and therefore I've been told that it can be done. And therefore, I expect that it will be done. Mark may have a different view in terms of confidence because he's been here for a year and he's been told this before. So I'm ever, ever the optimist and ever the, the positive. However, history is not um, a very strong indicator of achieving this. That's my, that's my concern. Yeah, and I, th I think I'd just add in there with that, I suppose, that history. So the the information we've got from um, officers to date about the outstanding issues and, and clearing down those issues is within the two week time frame seemed doable. Some of that is, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Peter will attest is is linked to the use of specialists outside of the organisation. So there's, there's making sure that the, the council liaise with their valuation specialists to get the, the turnaround that they need to, to get the final answers and therefore to be able to update the accounts as appropriate for that but history has shown as janet alludes to that you know we've had promises before which have slipped for one reason or another um but currently what is in place seems doable i believe it's down to the council to therefore deliver it i mean i think uh, i can just step in this reiterates the comments that we made at the last audit committee meeting about there being sufficient resource in place and a concern that i have is that from from ey we keep getting the information that they haven't got all all of the evidence that they need to complete the audit at this moment whereas in the report we're being told that they do have all the information so there, 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 there was a gap between what we believe we've provided and what EY believe they need. But we, we don't seem able to, to, to square that circle. And EY are, are challenging the organisation to come up with the resource that we've also challenged the organisation with in the past year to, de to deliver the audit on time. So the 2021 accounts can only be delivered if we get the resource in place to deliver the 1819 and then that rolls through to the 1920 to the 2021 we can only keep on repeating the same things again 
as an audit committee and as chair of the audit committee to this organisation to get the resources in place to prioritise it and to deliver the audit aligned with the EY requirements. We can't say anything clearer than that. And unfortunately, if, if we cannot move this organisation, then EY will have to move this organisation for this audit committee. That, that's the situation that we are now in. That it will get taken out of the hands of the audit committee and given to council to, to determine. Peter, would you like to reply? Certainly until now, um, I, I hadn't been given the, you know, I hadn't been given the, um, it hadn't been suggested to me that we, we would be able to catch up by 21, 20, uh, by summer of 2022. I am more than happy to get the resources in place to make sure we do. If that's the commitment of, of EY to support us in reaching that target, I'm more than happy to get whatever resources we need in order to achieve that. Does sound extremely optimistic and challenging, but nevertheless, when I was brought into this authority, the key target I was given was to get things up to date. And I am, you know, I will do everything in my power to make sure that happens. I accept that things have not gone well, and clearly part of that has to rest, you know, rest in my lap. But I will do everything that we can to get up to date. And if we have commitment from ourselves and commitment from EY to work together to achieve that target, then I am up for that. And I'm sure members here are also up for that. In that spirit, Chair, um, I'm, I'm going to do the old broken record. I think the toolkit for effectiveness of the audit committee it's probably best that we do our bit and if we can, you know, look at that as well because that might give us some help as a committee as to how we can be the most effective. I've asked for it time and time again. Hopefully it's umpteenth time lucky. Councillor Southwell. Um, I'd just like to, 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 to pick up on, on the Again, this two week, what needs to be done the next two weeks? I'm, I'm, um, I'm concerned by the the, the answer that um, everything seems possible, but um, we that, that it may not be possible. That there's still some level of concern that we may not be able to reach a target that's within two weeks of this meeting. Um, I just want to understand a bit more about why we why we're not in a position now um, to firmly commit to delivering on that? What, what are the variables that mean we're unable to do that today for a delivery deadline that's two weeks away? I mean, I, um, I think the key issue probably is getting the information from the external body. I, you know, I know we're talking to on a regular basis. Um, when I was uh, when I get to my report, I was going to go through the points uh, that have been raised. One of one of the issues is uh, we, we need to do some site inspections on 15 pieces of land, which is going to be carried out later this week. We will need to pass that information to the auditor uh, to the valuer, who will then make an assessment of whether there's an, a change of value required on those pieces of land. That information will need to be put into the asset register if, if necessary, and that we will then need to update uh, the uh, accounting statement for those changes. Now, I would think with a fair wind, we should be able to do that within two weeks, but we are, we are in the hands of the valuer, and you know, he is doing his work as we speak. So I, I'd sort of, I'd sort of agree with Mark. It's doable, but there are a number of risk factors in saying that. You know, subject to the valuer being able to complete his work in in time, um, and subject to um, completing the pieces of work. But uh, I believe Mark now has everything he needs 
apart from the information from the valuer. Is that correct? Um, not wholly correct. So, so there's three, as per our report, and, and I think obviously Peter addresses in his cover paper, there are three areas in regards to property, plant and equipment outstanding. So there's the, the work on the, the nil value surplus assets, which Peter's referring to, which is what's linked to the external valuer uh, performing a valuation of a, a proportion of those to, to ensure obviously the value is materially stated correctly in accounts. There's also an element of opening balance work still outstanding in regard to the the revaluation reserve and the splits of um, accounting entries between the revaluation reserve and the comprehensive income and expenditure statement. So we've we've had some progress on that, but the the council are currently pulling together a I guess a more up to date document about where we sit with that because the council are proposing a prior period adjustment to the 2017-18 account balances. Uh, we need to to ensure we've got enough evidence to support that that PPA, that um, prior period adjustment is is correct because clearly it's material and therefore we we can't just uh, just go back and update prior year figures without ensuring we're getting the, the correct position. So uh, we're currently waiting for an updated paper from the council on that. And then off the back of that, we'll need to assess if we need any further evidence to get to that position where we're assured that any PPA is, is appropriate. And then the, the third stream is getting a final version of the fixed asset register that reconciles to an updated statement of accounts note. Now that can't be done in totality at the moment because it depends on the first two points being completed, but that, so that'll be the final stage. So we are still waiting for information from the council in those three areas. But uh, EY have resource ready, willing, able for the next two weeks to work on any information provided by Peter and his team. Yes, we do. from the committee okay um, if the committee is accepting of this um, I would like to have a meeting with Peter and EY on a by daily basis that's every two days not twice a day um, to have an update on progress for the next two weeks that's what it is Chair, if you, if you could then circulate for other members of the committee to know, or at least for myself, I'd appreciate that. Yeah. Well, would would bi-daily be acceptable, or would you like to, I'm just going to, don't want to put any extra work on you when you've got enough work to be getting on with? Okay. Is that okay for EY? Yeah. It's not going to be a long meeting, it'll just be a catch-up on, on a bi-daily basis every two days for the next two weeks. And I'll, I'll provide an update for, for progress post that meeting to the members of, of the committee. No further comments? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, EY. Um, so the date of the next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, the 1st of December at 10 a.m. But following the discussion we just had, I'll get, provide updates on a regular basis in the next two weeks and be in contact with Peter and EY. Thank you, everybody.